they have a professor that talks about Washington's religion overall. And this professor that introduces us to Washington's religion, he tells us that like many deists, Washington, and so he starts off by telling us Washington is a deist. Now, why would he say that Washington is a deist? Well, he explains it to us. He says he's a deist because he uses terms like divine providence and divine author of our books. As David Barton has done before, he reads aloud something different from what the text actually says that he's showing them. The text says Washington used these terms because he was a deist. Barton claims that the professor was citing these terms as proof that Washington was a deist. Barton not only misleads the audience, but he implies that the real historians are deceiving them. And now he's going to zero in on the terminology as if it were the only reason for calling Washington a deist. Many things point to Washington being a deist, including the fact that his own minister called him a deist. Uh, this little thing about the founding fathers used the term providence a whole lot, and therefore it proves they're deist. I get this from professors all the time. You, you look at literally the, the language of the founders, and it uses terms like providence and like all, almighty overseer and things like that. But that's an interesting thing. Uh, and by the way, let me show you some of the quotes of academics who, who point this out. It says, the declaration mentions nature's God and divine providence. That's the language of deism, not of Christianity. Christianity would have put Jesus Christ in there somewhere. Christianity would have put the Redeemer of man. The, but no, 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 they didn't do that. They, they used things like nature's God and divine providence. Here's another professor. It says, Washington preferred titles such as the divine author of our blessed religion, almighty being, providence, and grand designer, all terms from deist beliefs. And I can keep going on and on. This is called the Geneva Bible. It was printed first in 1560. And from 1560 to 1644, it went through 144 reprints. This is the book that our early forefathers brought to America. You see the pilgrims? This is the painting that hangs inside the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol. This, is, this painting is 14 feet high. It is 20 feet wide. It is a life-size, massive painting of the pilgrims. And they're gathered around a Bible. And the Bible is so big in the Capitol, you can actually read the words on the Bible. And if you do, you find out it's a Geneva Bible. And it's interesting that they keep using the word providence. As a matter of fact, the Geneva Bible uses the word providence 100 times in the Bible. Now, I checked editions of the Bible online just in the last week or so. I've only found just a couple of editions of the Bible that even use the word providence anymore at all. But you go back to the most popular Bible in their day, it uses the word providence 100 times. You know what that means? That is biblical language. No, it isn't. The whole reason he has to refer to the Geneva Bible 150 years before the founding is because the 17th century commentary in that edition used this terminology, this one word. He has narrowed the whole issue of deism down to terminology, then to a single word. The deism of some founders is irrefutable, and Barton is desperate to obscure this any way he can. They tell you from the Bible what taxes are right and what taxes are wrong. Bible's not against taxes, but it's against certain kinds of taxes. Bible's against a capital gains tax. It's, it's, it's against an estate tax. It's against a progressive tax. Bible's not against capitation taxes. He gives no evidence for this whatsoever, and there is no evidence. In fact, the biblical tithe was based on income, and the capital gains tax are a tax on certain kinds of income, as is the inheritance tax. The difference between these and ordinary income taxes is that the capital gains tax is lower than ordinary income tax and affects primarily the wealthy. The U.S. inheritance tax only affects estates over $5.34 million. Yet he thinks it's unfair to have that tax at all. Interestingly, the payroll tax, that is Social Security, affects wages only up to $118,500 per year. There is no payroll tax over that amount. Moreover, it exempts all investment income. With all his talk of fair, flat, and equal tax, he finds nothing wrong with this. He also accepts a capitation tax, which means charging everybody the same amount, regardless of income. The beggar on the street pays the same dollar amount as a billionaire. If that's biblical, then it's just another good reason to ignore the Bible. Jefferson is so Jefferson's just a typical founding father, they said. And Jefferson is so secular that when he formed the University of Virginia, it was the first purely secular university in America. 
That tells you how secular he is. One of our leading founding fathers formed the University of Virginia first period. Now, they said, how do we know it's a secular university? Because it had absolutely no chaplain at the university. The fact it had no chaplain, the only university in that age to have no chaplain, this proves just exactly how radical Jefferson and the founding fathers were. They didn't want religion to have anything to do with it. Barton here tries to narrow down the issue of did Jefferson want this to be secular to this one question. Was there a chaplain at the University of Virginia? Then he shows these people, as you'll see in a moment, an advertisement for a chaplain at the university. And so on they go. Well, because we own 100,000 documents from before 1812, I just had a lot of fun. I went over and just picked up some original documents, started bringing documents out, and I brought over some newspapers. And the newspapers were ads that had been run in Washington, D.C. newspapers for the brand new University of Virginia. And these were ads were trying to recruit kids from D.C. to come down and go to school at the University of Virginia, because it's not that far from D.C., University of Virginia. So they, that's a good place for them to get students. And in looking at the ads, here's one of the ads, and their ads back there are a lot more like op-ed pieces. It's not like the ads we see today. I mean, this, this is an ad. And it's signed at the bottom by Septimus Tustus. And he is the chaplain of the university. Now, wait a minute. I thought they didn't have a chaplain. What's a chaplain doing in ad? Barton does not tell these people that Tustin became chaplain 10 years after Jefferson died. In fact, he deliberately misleads them by saying that this was the brand new University of Virginia, when in fact the university was 11 years old before this chaplain started there. In addition to this, Barton's own website notes the chaplain was paid by voluntary donations and not supported by the state. In Liars for Jesus, page 172, in a letter, Jefferson stated that he would not want theology taught at the University of Virginia. He had abolished the theology school at William and Mary. In fact, there were no religious activities at the University of Virginia until after Jefferson and Madison had died, page 175 of Liars for Jesus. In fact, the Christians at that time claimed that an outbreak of typhoid at the University of Virginia was because of the absence of religion at the school. The university repeatedly denied the use of the campus for prayer and sermons during Jefferson's lifetime when he was in charge. When people tried to get religion into the school, Jefferson suggested that the various denominations set up their own theological schools adjacent to the campus at their own expense if they wanted religious education. David Barton, in his book, Original Intent, spun this fact to his advantage. Quote, Jefferson expected students to participate in the various religious schools which he personally had invited to locate adjacent to and upon the university property, when in fact the whole reason they were separate schools was because the university refused to have theology in the school. Rather than having a chaplain from one denomination, they said, you know, Virginia has got Baptists, and it's got Presbyterians, and, and it's got Methodists, and it's got Episcopalians. We'll just have the chaplain rotate every year from one of those four denominations because we're going to be the first school in America not founded by a single denomination only for that purpose. See, William & Mary is founded by Anglicans for Anglicans. The reason they rotated the chaplaincy at the University of Virginia is because they had to split the cost among the denominations. It was not paid for by the university or the taxpayer. Uh, Harvard University and Yale were both founded by Congregationalists for Congregations. Brown University is founded by Baptists for Baptists. Transylvania is founded by the Church of Christ for the Church, by the disciples. I mean, all of them had... Barton goes on implying once again that other universities were founded by a single denomination. This was founded by multiple denominations, and that's just not true. It was founded by the state of Virginia, not by any denomination, for any denomination, and any theology teaching occurred off campus. Back in November of 1998, a big national news story came out on Thomas Jefferson. At that point in time, there was uh, a story that was written for Nature and Science magazines, the accompanying articles written by Professor Joseph Ellis, Pulitzer Prize winning historian said, well, we now know it. DNA testing proves 
that Thomas Jefferson fathered the children of Sally Hemings. He slept with slave Sally Hemings and her children came from Tom. DNA has now proved it. And that story went across the nation. 221 outlets carried the story that Thomas Jefferson had slept with Sally Hemings and produced her children. Unfortunate, oh, wait a minute, maybe it wasn't because six weeks later, Nature and Science retracted the story and said, nope, sorry, DNA proved just the opposite, proved that he didn't have children by Hemings. The press often did report this as proof of Jefferson's paternity, even though the committee report did not claim that this was a scientific certainty. However, the report stated that the conclusion of the committee was that Thomas Jefferson was the father based on a combination of DNA plus historical factors. This is still the majority opinion today, even though it is possible that either Thomas Jefferson's brother Randolph or his nephews fathered the children. The so-called correction that Barton refers to merely points out this possibility. At no point has anyone claimed that the evidence proved Jefferson was not the father. No one except David Barton and the gullible people who trust him. This is an out-and-out -out lie that Barton tells here. When I heard him say this on the Glenn Beck show, like an idiot, I thought it was an inadvertent slip of the tongue during an interview. It's not the only time I have foolishly given him the benefit of the doubt, only to find out that he really is that dishonest. Check the references in my notes for the complete report. And so this article, this DNA testing, actually ended up helping President Clinton in impeachment, which is what its purpose was, which is why after that was over, they retracted the story. No, that is not why they did the testing, why the committee came to its conclusions, or why the media ran with the salacious story. And no, they did not retract the story. They merely made it clear that it was not a scientific certainty. And to this, see, it's, it's fairly interesting. I don't want to get into the science very deep, but let me just tell you something right up front. If you're going to test for paternity from anyone right now, you would have to get their DNA, okay? So, real simple. Well, Jefferson's dead 200 years, so what do you do? Well, you get a, a, the DNA of a male descendant because a male descendant across generations, the Y chromosome does not change from generation to generation. The Y chromosome of Thomas' male descendants is the same today that it was 200 years ago. You poor bastard, you just can't get anything right, can you? The Y chromosome may be the fastest evolving part of the genome. We already knew that this guy couldn't get his history right, and earlier, we learned that his geography was way off when he described going from Brooklyn to Manhattan as sailing over the horizon. Now we see that he gets his biology wrong, too. Check out the notes I have below. The DNA test was from the Y chromosome of the descendants of Thomas Jefferson's uncle compared to the Y chromosome of the male descendants of Sally Hemings. The testing proved that her oldest son was not a Jefferson and that her youngest son was a Jefferson. It could not tell which Jefferson was the father. Only problem was Thomas Jefferson didn't have any male descendants. They didn't use DNA from Thomas Jefferson at all. They did not use any of Jefferson's DNA. He didn't even have DNA. So how did they get DNA proving that he had done this since they didn't even have DNA from Thomas Jefferson? Uh, that's an irrelevant point. We, we had a story going on. Half a minute ago, he was saying the Y chromosome didn't change in 200 years. And now he can't comprehend that it didn't change from Thomas Jefferson's grandfather to Jefferson and his uncle. And of course, he doesn't point out how this testing proved Jefferson's non-paternity. Again, academic, see a PhD told us this, so we can all believe it now. I recently asked a group of 120 law students I was dealing with, I, I, I do a lot of teaching law schools, universities, 120 law students, and they were from about 60 different, 60 different law schools. And I said, how many of you have been told by your professor that Thomas Jefferson slept with Sally Hemings? 95% of hands went up. See, this thing is still being taught out there, and it's because a Pulitzer Prize winning professor said it was so. No, it's not because a Pulitzer Prize winner said so. If anything, they would want to be disassociated from him because this formerly respected professor in question, Joseph Ellis, was caught lying about his Vietnam War record in his classroom. This caused him to be suspended from his professorship for four years without pay. 
The reason most, but not all, historians still believe Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, fathered Hemings' later children is a combination of DNA and historical evidence. No, that's not the truth. That's not what it was. Now, in the same way, let me take you into what's called the Jefferson Bible. A lot of people jump me on this and say, how can you say Thomas Jefferson was not an atheist? Look what he did to the Bible. He cut out everything he disagreed with. Deist, not atheist. Get a dictionary, look it up. He cut out all the miracles, all the, and, and, and I'll, I'll look at them and, and, and I act like I don't know what they're talking about. And I say, Imagine this guy acting more ignorant than he already is. What are you talking about? And they said, you know, that, that thing. He, I said, what thing? Well, you know, the Jefferson Bible. The Jefferson Bible? And then I look at them and say, which Jefferson Bible are you talking about? And they say, you mean there's more than one? At that point, I know they don't have a clue what they're talking about because there were two Jefferson Bibles that were done. There was one that was done. And, you know, he went through and, and cut out those passages. And there was one that was done in 1804, and there was one that was done in 1820. Now, what's the difference between the two, and what's the story? That's actually the, the picture of, of the Bible that he cut those passages out of. What's this? Now, we're, we're assuming here that if Jefferson cut passages out of the Bible and supernatural, miraculous stuff that he disagreed with, then we've got to assume that he's got an overall problem with the Bible. Fair thing to assume? I mean, if, if you're cutting out stuff in the Bible you disagree with, then you've got a pro problem with the Bible. So what was Jefferson's view of the whole Bible, the traditional Bible? Well, a couple of things I can point to. He was a member of the Virginia Bible Society, which seems kind of strange because they distribute the whole Bible. They didn't cut anything out of it. He's, a matter of fact, a lifetime member of the Virginia Bible Society. He gave very large contributions to Virginia Bible Society for the distribution of Bibles. He found out there were people in the state that didn't have a Bible. He said, I can't imagine that. I can't imagine people in Virginia not having a Bible. Here's a really big contribution to help you get a Bible in the hands of a lifetime member of Virginia Bible Society. He gave contributions to Bible distribution. In one interview, Barton even claimed that Jefferson was a founder of the society. There is no evidence of this, and Barton has never shown evidence of it. In fact, when Jefferson was asked for a contribution, he made it clear that he was unaware of the society. He expressed hope that they would not use the Bible to evangelize other countries, but he did donate $50, saying the Gospels were good moral instruction. This is the large donation that Barton referred to and is the donation that made him a life member. And Jefferson had made the statement that it was easy to separate from the good from the bad in the Bible as it was to separate diamonds from a dunghill. He also helped print the largest Bible ever done in the United States at that time, called the John Thompson Bible. He also helped print the Woodward Bible, which was an eight-volume Bible that was done shortly after there. He also offered to help print, but it was too late to help print what was called the Thompson Bible. He's into printing Bibles, and he offers financially to help print and produce Bibles. Documents show he was a subscriber to these two Bibles. This means that he made a down payment on the cost of one copy of the book before it was printed. This practice was called a subscription. Barton has, an, on occasion, portrayed this as financing the publication. So if I pre-order the next John Grisham novel at Amazon, that makes me an investor or a financier of its publication in Barton's magical world of Jesus. The fact is Jefferson had an extensive library with multiple copies of the Bible in it, as well as at least one Koran. That didn't make him a Muslim or a Christian. In fact, I downloaded a copy of the Geneva Bible for this video. Someone asked David Barton if that makes me a Christian and saves me from eternal damnation. So according to the records of the Washington, D.C. Historical Society, Jefferson's the guy who wrote the plan of education for Washington, D.C. public schools, which used the Bible as a reading text in Washington, D.C. public schools. Yes, they did. Years after Jefferson ceased to have anything to do with the public schools in D.C., just one more example of how Barton points to what an institution did when Jefferson had nothing to do with it in an attempt to convince his ignorant and gullible followers that Jefferson had something to do with this. So what Jefferson did was he took those two Bibles out of the White House and he started cutting out passages. Now, it's interesting what Jefferson called this book, this book that he did for the Indians, 
It's really simple. He took Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's where he cut the passages from, and this is the title he put on it. The Philosophy of Jesus of Nazareth, being extracted from the account of his life and, and doctrines, given by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, being an abridgment of the New Testament for the use of Indians. Barton talks on the Jefferson Bible. He starts with talk of evangelizing the Indians. As we've seen previously, Jefferson had made it clear that evangelizing the Indians was not his desire. Keep in mind that neither of Jefferson's versions of the Gospels were ever published until 1902. And nobody has ever seen the 1804 version that he talks about. If anyone ever did evangelize the Indians, it wasn't with his Bible. So when that book is all over and done with, and we know what was in it because of the passages he cut from those two Bibles, you know, it's kind of interesting. What appeared in that was Jesus raising the dead, Jesus healing the sick, Jesus casting out demons, Jesus the Son of God, Jesus and the Second Coming, and heaven, hell, and angels. Now, I could be wrong, but that sounds kind of supernatural to me. <laughs> Raising the dead, healing the sick, casting out demons, Jesus, Son of God, the second coming. And we're told, oh, no, Jefferson cut out all the miraculous stuff. What's this? See, this is the 1804 version. And that's why I love asking people what they're talking about, because they don't even... Barton's logic is that since these verses with miracles were missing from these source Bibles, they must have been pasted into the original Jefferson Bible in 1804. But there's no evidence for this. He just asserts it. He doesn't have any evidence for it. And I've learned not to take his word for anything. He has no explanation as to why Jefferson's finished and surviving version of 1820 has none of these miracles. The entire 1820 Jefferson Bible can be viewed online at Google Books for free. The Kindle version is available from Amazon, 99 cents. I read through the Sermon on the Mount in this Bible before giving up looking for miracles. The nativity story has no virgin birth, no angels, no star of Bethlehem. The baptism has no dove, no voice from heaven. The people who came to him for healing weren't healed. The Sermon on the Mount occurred without the feeding of the thousands. When I skipped to the end, there was death and burial, no resurrection. To this day, I've asked everybody who's told me about the Jefferson Bible, said, have you, have you ever read it? Well, no, I've never read it. Well, how do you know it cut out all the miracles? Well, that's what everybody says. There it is, academic collectivism. All this man has to do is to show one passage in the Jefferson Bible that contains a miracle. He doesn't, and he knows his followers won't go looking for it. Apparently, academic collectivism means what every other historian in the world knows to be true, except David Barton. And see, that's what all the scholars and critics tell us, is Jefferson was so anti-religious he cut this stuff out. Not so. Yes, it is so. So what you did was you went through and read every one of these to see where they were strong and where they were weak. And Jefferson did every one of them. You know what Jefferson did? Jefferson compared every one of them. He said, Jesus beats every one of them hands down. There's nobody that comes close to the moral teachings of Jesus. All of these evil, atheistic, humanist historians who David Barton has been criticizing have always recognized that Jefferson liked the moral teachings of Jesus. Jefferson even stated that he was a Christian in the sense of following Jesus' moral teaching. Barton acts like this is facts about Thomas Jefferson that they don't want you to know. And that's why the book is literally called The Life and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, how do we get this to be the Jefferson Bible? I'm not quite sure, but what happened? Notice that Barton didn't mind calling the 1804 version of the Jefferson Bible the Jefferson Bible because it doesn't exist and he can pretend that it included anything he wants. Now he's questioning why we call the 1820 version by that same name, even though it's the only version that people have ever seen or read. That's because it plainly does not contain anything suggesting Jesus to be more than a moral teacher. In the next part, I'll cover how David Barton tells us that the witch trials were not caused by the Bible. They were put an end to by the Bible, Geneva Bible in particular.